Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 72nd ECHO session. We want to thank everybody that has joined us, both from the public sector, private sector, NGO world. Uh, we will not introduce everyone individually because of time. Here in the hub, we are joined by Dr. Agwe Mwemba. He's a physician and he specializes in nephrology. But aside that, he's, the family, he's one of the infectious disease family. He has done a lot of work in HIV. We are also joined by Davis from pharmacy and we have co-chief, Kozia Ziambo, and of course we have the team from IT. As you may notice, we have very few people in the hub because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for the past few weeks, we've been running the COVID-19 pandemic series. And today, we are talking about cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. But before we go into today's session, I would like to ask uh, Davis to give us a, pre, uh, a recap of last week's session. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon once again. So uh, well, last week, we were simply looking at the experiences from China and Italy concerning the COVID-19 uh, management. And a little background was given how that four, first four cases of pneumonia of a non-pathogen were reported in Wuhan province uh, in China, or Wuhan city in China, on December 29th. Uh, 2019, and WHO notified uh, this on the 31st of December 2019. And then on the 7th of January, the there was a Chinese scientist who had isolated the no novel coronavirus from three patients. And this disease uh, caused by the virus is named as COVID-19, as you may be aware. And then on the March, on, on the 11th of March, uh, WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. So there are several things that were considered, pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions where COVID-19 management is concerned. We had some universal population measures uh, on the non-pharmacological interventions, and case isolation and management, then uh, close contact quarantine, suspension of public gatherings and movement uh, restrictions. And then concerning the tailored control measures at varied uh, risk levels, uh, where low risk areas are concerned, strictly prevent importation, then medium risk areas pre to prevent importation and stop uh, local transmission where possible, high risk areas to simply stop local transmission, prevent exportation, and implement strict prevention and control measures. And for the antiviral therapy or pharma pharmacological therapy, of course, we uh, time and again have been reminded that there is no definitive uh, treatment that is known yet. However, of course, we have been hearing uh, through the research that is ongoing concerning remdesivir that it has shown some promise as an, an uh, effective antiviral. Um, but remember, no definitive treatment known yet. And for the vaccines, no proven effective vaccine has been uh, made yet. For prevention of healthcare workers associated infections, there was serious emphasis concerning uh, ensuring of triage, early recognition, and source control, and then standard IPC measures such as hygiene, uh, hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene, injection safety practices, environmental cleaning, and sterilization of patient care equipment. For administrative controls, ensure availability of PPEs, and then each institution to have a focal point person to check compliance of PPE use. And then we also were reminded to have as many trainings as possible where infection prevention is concerned. So these are some of the things that were highlighted from last week. Thank you. Over to you, Somba. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I think I've already been uh, introduced. And this afternoon, I'm discussing COVID-19 and NCD comorbidity. I should mention that this was supposed to be combined with uh, renal, uh, but looking at the magnitude, we say we should extend it to next time. So I'll discuss NCDs today, uh, the vascular disease today, and I should thank Dr. Kawe for sharing uh, some of the information or some of the 
uh, information that I use to prepare these, these slides. I'm not a cardiologist myself, um, so I might miss a few things, and I hope that um, I should be able to communicate well enough for you to get something out of, uh, out of this. Um, I'm struggling. Clicking? Yeah. Sorry, we're still struggling. So this is um, Johan, the famous one. And just like uh, as earlier alluded to, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, first was reported to the official as a pneumonia of a known cause in Wuhan, China, on the 1st of December 2019. Um, and the last, some of the markets that um, uh, it's believed that this virus um, could have come from, and it was shattered on uh, January 1st. Uh, that's the famous um, Yuhan Institute of Virology in central China. And most of you that probably heard other stories were probably the virus that I've looked from is the famous. Uh, I'm just here, we're just highlighting how the pandemic, uh, the pandemic has um, uh, happened over, over the years. And uh, this has the numbers total now is 4.1 million. As of yesterday, and they, they obviously by now this number has, um, has has increased, and you can see that the yellow, and you can see that now actually what is happening is that you can see that uh, the. The pandemic now it seems to be uh, stabilizing uh, in the Western uh, in the Western world. We do not know what is going to happen, obviously with Africa on top there. The color obviously you can't see it's quite strong. I hand over to. Thank you so much, Doctor Mwemba. So please let's take time to read that poem. It's quite lengthy. Uh, before we actually share the poem. So what is the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease in severe COVID-19 in hospital patients compared with the general population? Do we think the prevalence is the same with the general population? Do we think the prevalence is high in the general population? Or is the prevalence high in severe COVID-19 in hospital patients? The prevalence of diabetes is high among severe covid patients while hypertension and cardiovascular disease is high in the general population. I acknowledge that this is a bit of a, a mouthful, so we'll give a bit extra time for people to go. Of course, Dr. Mwemba will talk about all this in his presentation. He just wants to get a sense of what we think. I see people are voting. I must say, Dr. Mwemba, I appreciated your slide where you showed the Yangtze River uh, meeting with the blue Haijang River. Yes. So it looks like this um, Wuhan is a very, it's a, it's a city within Hubei province, yes. and Hubei has almost 6 million people. And Wuhan, really huge. and Wuhan itself has 11 million people. For 11 million people. <laughs> and this city was almost made the capital of Beijing, isn't it? And they have a lot of, it's an economic hub, a lot of tourists, a lot of people are transiting from this place. And this, I think, helped the virus easily. Okay. So this is what people are thinking. Um, I, I acknowledge it's a bit of a mouthful, but you, you go over this. So do we think the prevalence in, we are comparing people that are admitted with severe COVID-19 and the general population. Do we think the prevalence is the same? Or is the general population, do they have more cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension? And foresee the prevalence is high in severe COVID-19 in hospital patients. 
the prevalence of diabetes is high among severe COVID-19 patients, but hypertension and diabetes is the, the, is the same. Uh, please go ahead with the, the, pouring, the, the polling. Um, okay, we will be ending the polling in a few seconds. Okay, so this is how we polled. Slightly less than half felt that it's higher in, um, in hospital patients, but of course we have variations. I'm sure by the time we're done, it's better. Our second poll question, what is the mortality rate in severe COVID-19 patients with hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease compared with severe COVID-19 patients without these comorbidities? What is the rate in people that have comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease? Then you compare people with severe COVID-19 but no comorbidities. And the prevalence is the same in the two groups. Mortality rate is high in those with severe COVID-19 and comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Mortality is high in severe COVID-19 patients without comorbidities. Mortality rate is high in severe COVID-19 patients with cardiovascular disease alone. It's a mouthful. So, what do we think? Who's more likely to die when they get a severe form of COVID-19? Okay, very interesting. I'm sure you can see that, Dr. Kamwemba. I saw a picture of the Institute of Virology that you saw. I thought that lab is the one that sequenced the, the genome and then they shared it. That's the same lab, yes, that's. Okay, it's so a, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's a, a very, very high-tech yes, lab. It's a very okay. And they've been doing a lot of uh, research even as COVID-1. Okay. And yes, so they have quite mm -hmm. a lot of it. Okay, so there we go. This is our Pauline, I'm going to end that and share the results. Okay, so most people think that the mortality is high in severe COVID-19 patients with hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Um, so, this slide is just looking at um, uh, the prevalence of comorbidities uh, in patients with COVID-19 and the general population. And that slide there just shows you that when you look at uh, uh, the prevalence of COVID-19 uh, in the US, uh, it's slightly, for diabetics, slightly higher than in the US. 10.9 versus 9.9.8. And for obesity, again, you can see that uh, in the COVID-19 patients, higher in the COVID-19 patients as compared to the, um, uh, to the general population in the US. While in China, uh, you see that uh, it's just slightly, cardiovascular disease is slightly higher in COVID-19 patients versus the general uh, general population. So um, it seems that in the general population, overall in patients who have COVID-19 patients, it seems to be a trend that um, comorbidities are higher uh, in patients with COVID-19. This is trying to show you in severe COVID-19 patient disease, those who have diabetes, hypertension, and co, and they are admitted, 
And you can see that uh, this slide is showing diabetes there and hypertension there and cardiovascular disease. Um, and this is uh, COVID-19. And you can see that um, the rates here are actually they are higher as well. And this is also in China. This is true in Italy. This is uh, true also in the, in the, in the US. This is looking at uh, the risk of death uh, when you have one of these comorbidities. Um, and as you can see here, uh, diabetes here, um, and you can see that, uh, unfortunately I can't see from this, side, but the odds ratio there is nine. Nine just means that there's 900 times chance that a patient who has um, uh, diabetes is going to die of uh, COVID-19 when they have covid and teen disease. So, this, so a, a patient who has diabetes and they have COVID-19, the chances of them dying is very high when they, as compared to a patient who has no uh, diabetes. Second one is hypertension. And the, you can see that hypertension, they give you seven. And seven means that, uh, seven there again means that a patient who has uh, hypertension has 700 times risk of dying if they have hypertension and they get COVID-19, as someone who gets COVID-19 and have no hypertension. So Dr. Mwemba, before you move on, so in general, we say that the case fatality rate from something like COVID-19 is 2.3%, yes. but this is in general. So if I have diabetes or hypertension, that number Changes, it isn't changes. it, to nine times more from the odds ratio, or exactly. seven times more if I have hypertension? Exactly. So it increases because of the risk, because of you having uh, either hypertension or diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So that risk uh, gets very high, extremely high. Our third poll question, thank you. Which of the following statements best describes mechanisms of cardiac injury in COVID-19 patients. Direct cardiotoxicity by the virus is the sole cause of cardiac injury. Viral-driven cytokine storm is the sole cause of cardiac injury. Hypoxemia due to sepsis and the DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, best explain cardiac injury. Cardiac injury is multifactorial. So today we are sitting in the physician's room, but I know our audience has been um, very curious about this. And we have um, a wide spectrum of healthcare workers. So this is very interesting, Dr. Mwemba. So there you go. Which of the following best describes the mechanisms of cardiac injury? Is it only direct toxicity? Is it only the cytokine storm that the virus causes? Is it only the hypoxemia due to sepsis and DIC, or is this injury multifactorial? So I'm sure you can see the voting pattern. I'm almost very tempted to keep, <laughs> very impressive, to keep this, this going. You know, Dr. Mwemba, when I was in training, the first person that told me about the cytokine was you. <laughs> That's all. I yes. Remember, the cytokine storm. <laughs> Pepsi. I'm happy now that you can discuss it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So people are calling. This is very interesting, actually. I didn't expect such overwhelming response. Um, so a few people think it's actually just the virus going to attack the, the myocardium. While well, others feel it's the, just that cytokine storm. And we have some people thinking it's just the hypoxia that comes due to the sepsis, the perfusion supply imbalance testing. And there's also that it could be all these and many other things that may be unknown, actually. We're going to end the polling and see how we voted. Okay, so this is our fourth poll question. 
which of the following statement is true about high, highly sensitive cardiac, cardiac troponin in COVID-19 patients? The highly sensitive cardiac troponin predicts mortality in COVID-19 patients. B, highly sensitive cardiac troponin is a mark of cardiac injury in COVID-19 patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease and those without pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Highly sensitive card cardiac troponin is higher in older COVID-19 patients than in the younger patients. All of these are correct. Let's see our voting. So do you want to talk about the highly sensitive cardiac troponin in yes, terms so of how is it you know, um, different from the, the normal top T? Um, obviously, I think that obviously there's some structural differences uh, with the, the normal troponin. Um, and therefore, when you test it in the lab, uh, this seems to give you a very high uh, sensitivity. So when you say someone is, um, uh, it is positive, then it tells you that probably someone has a, a cardiac injury, and that um, makes you um, uh, proxenicate them. Um, and so that, that's, that's the main that's the main difference. So, so it okay. is used as a marker of uh, cardiac injury. So when it's very high, you admit a patient and it's high, it means that probably that injury is recent. You need to take it. Yes. <clears throat> so which of the following statements is true about highly sensitive cardiac troponin in COVID-19? It predicts mortality in COVID-19 patients. It is a marker of cardiac injury in COVID-19 patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease and those without pre-existing cardiovascular disease. It is higher in older COVID-19 patients than in the younger patients. All the above are correct. So thank you so much, Dr. Member, for actually giving us a preamble to that. I know most of our labs are now moving towards the highly sensitive uh, troponin. For some reason, the polling is not ending. I'm just So as we go through this, uh, we'll be answering um, some of your some of your questions. Um, um, so pre-existing cardiac disease um, patients seem more prone to severe complications, and they have increased. Uh, so there's this uh, case, uh, case series that looked at 184 uh, 84 patients uh, in COVID-19 patients. Um, and they looked at uh, patients who had uh, cardiovascular, um, uh, cardiac, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, underlying, and patients who had a new cardiac, uh, cardiac injury. Obviously, the new cardiac injury is indicated by uh, your high uh, troponin. So when you compare uh, between the two, individuals that have been underlying cardiac disease, uh, they had more uh, individuals that had a positive, uh, high sensitivity. Now, does this matter? Uh, so they looked at mortality in the hospitals um, and then based it on, um, on um, CVD, that is cardiovascular disease underlying, and also looked at the uh, level of troponin. If an individual has um, high troponin, it means that probably they have also a new, a new injury. Um, <clears throat> so they looked at individuals that had, uh, at baseline, no cardiovascular disease, and had no more uh, troponin, uh, mortality was only 74. When they looked at an individuals that had no more troponin and uh, had a cardiovascular disease, mortality was high. So can you see that having a, an underlying cardiovascular disease, uh, just even when your troponin is not high, the risk factor. And they moved on and looked at, you had no cardiovascular disease and you had high troponin, and see that the high troponin, despite having no cardiovascular disease, mortality was 37.5%. What does this mean? This means that individuals that develop COVID-19, 
they have high troponin, meaning that they've developed a new cardiac disease, they are likely to, uh, to have a high mortality than individuals that have cardiac disease with no more troponin. Um, but the scenario gets worse when you have both uh, underlying disease and new injury to the underlying disease. The mortality goes up to 70%. Uh, and so what this means is that individual that has a cardiovascular disease uh, and they develop high protein, uh, uh, high troponin, the mortality in hospital is very, is very high. That's why we need to ensure that these patients that they come, we actually find out whether they have an underlying cardiovascular disease because mortality will be high if they have a new insult when they are admitted. Uh, <clears throat> and they looked at individuals that uh, had a high mortality. Um, could this be just because they have a cardiovascular disease or this could be because they are, they are age-related um, factors? So we know that uh, when you have a cardiovascular disease, um, cardiovascular disease might just be a marker of accelerated aging. Um, and therefore, when you age very early, it means that your immune system is also being uh, downgraded. So you are not going to spend yourself into whatever insults that so probably cardiovascular disease itself does uh, make individuals that are even younger aging early, therefore uh, impairing the immune, uh, immune system. But we know that probably there could be other mechanisms that affect COVID-19 in this particular individual. But we also know that age itself uh, is a risk factor uh, and is a determinant of, um, of death in uh, COVID-19. Uh, 19 patients. And we've all seen that uh, the people that died more are those who are poor age. When you look at this, you find that uh, mortality is high in those who are 80 and above, 14.8%, compared to the younger ones. Those of the obvious event for us, about 50 is, the, is all. But you can see the difference between someone who's 80 and someone who's 70. The one who's 80 is 15% um, times likely to, to die than one who's less than. And therefore, age contributes to. Uh, uh, I should mention that elevated troponin levels are higher in older patients than you know. So, uh, when you are old, you are likely to have a higher troponin. And that's why probably we see that uh, individuals that have cardiovascular disease and they are old and they have got high protein, uh, uh, troponin, they are also likely to, uh, uh, to die. This is just a cartoon um, trying to illustrate what happens in COVID-19. So here I have a virus, and this virus, uh, this virus, um, so here I have the virus, and this virus interacts with what we call um, uh, AC2 here. Uh, but let me just take you here that I think we know all this physiology, some of us that. Um, angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1, when it's broken down, it gives you ACE here and it gives you ACE2 here. Uh, each one of them has, uh, this one has obviously poor prognostic uh, effects going downwards and it will lead to tissue injury. Whereas ACE2 has good things that, and it leads to tissue breakage. So this is very nice. Whereas that is very, very bad. So we, we need to know that in Individuals that have kidney disease, individuals that have cardiac disease, uh, individuals that uh, they do express what gives them the disease is that most of it goes to ACE, ACE, and they produce all these that goes to tissue injury. So this is one of the reasons that probably uh, cardiac disease, kidney disease, hypertension, they all tend to have um, high expression of ACE2. And therefore, they also have SCE uh, and SCE2 at the same time. But imagine when you give these individuals, for example, SCE inhibitors or ARBs for those that are working in these clinics, is that probably you might shift uh, this cascade to SCE, SCE2. And therefore, when the, this virus comes, it finds that a lot of cells are expressing SCE2. And this might lead to the reasons why probably individuals that, uh, why these people who are carrying these comorbidities have an increased risk as well. Um, so just like I said, um, there's high transmission in uh, COVID-19 patients because this interaction between the virus and the ACE2 seems to be 
uh, to be uh, to be strong uh, in patients that are getting infected with COVID with COVID nineteen, opposed to um, to uh, SARS uh, COVID one. There's also high expression in viola, and that's why individuals tend first of all to give symptoms of um, uh, chest uh, chest involvement or other organs are, are expressed. In the cardiac, 7.5% of the myocytes do express um, um, FE2 uh, protein. So Dr. Mwemba, in English, what you are saying is, the SARS-CoV has a component that has to interact with the ACE2 receptor in the human, in the human body, yes. right? Which is found in a lot of parts of the body, yes. of which some of it is the lab, mostly, yes. that's yes. why of it goes to the lungs True. and of course the, the cardiac. Yes. And herein also lies the hypothesis as why children tend to get less, yes. less. Um, mortality and morbidity yes. because this they do not have the full expression there. Yeah, yes. they mm -hmm. don't have a lot of these receptors. Yes. Okay. And those yes. who are older it means that there's a shift towards expressing both AC1, SCE and the AC2. Therefore in all these organs they express a lot of AC2, so that's, that's a likelihood that probably they develop uh, organ involvement, other organ involvement. Okay. That's what I'm thinking. So, um, I think I've gone through this that mechanisms of cardiac injury from COVID have not yet been fully um, explained, uh, but most likely they are multifactorial. And I'm going to go through it. It could be their direct uh, toxicity to the, uh, to the heart, and this has been proven by having these viruses found in cardiac tissue. Secondly, this could be the, because of the body reacting to the, to the virus and so you produce this cytokine storm that then causes inflammation. And once there's inflammation, if you have a plaque, that plaque becomes destabilized and then it clogs into the coronary arteries and then you have the um, It could be just because the, uh, the heart must get inflamed uh, because of the cytokine that you're and individuals become hypercoagulable, uh, and so they block vessels in the heart um, or wherever they are. Um, but it can also be because of these cytokines also probably have a direct impact on the myocardium. So there are multifactorial factors that, uh, <clears throat> that might lead to this. Also, these patients are prone to sepsis and DIC. And as we know, DIC uh, causes uh, <clears throat> a demand uh, uh, imbalance which may lead to um, uh, cardiac, cardiac injury. The vessel might be open enough, and I'm going to show a cartoon over this thing. The vessel might be open enough, but because there's uh, hypotension, then it means oxygen supply to the myocardium is impaired because of the myocardium, uh, myocardium suffers. Um, <clears throat> so this, this panel is just trying to uh, illustrate what I've just said, that SARS-CoV-2 uh, can go directly and infect your Whatever and uh, the myocardium and causes uh, toxicity, or it might come into uh, your lungs and then you have hypoxemia and this hypoxemia causes uh, injury to the to, to your myocardium, or it might be because you have developed sepsis and so there is a supply demand mismatch because of your low BPs that you develop and therefore the myocardium also suffers. And like I said it could be a cytokine storm. Or indeed, it could be a DIC that you develop. And all these can either cause an acute coronary syndrome, it can cause myocarditis, uh, it can cause heart failure, new heart failure, um, uh, it can cause a thromboembolism and causes um, arrhythmias. Actually, our fifth poll question Which of the following statements best describes diagnostic modalities for COVID 19 related cardiovascular disease? The highly sensitive, uh, trop highly sensitive troponin is sufficient to secure the diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction in COVID 19 patients. The diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction should also be based on symptoms and signs only. The echo is important to diagnose stress-related cardiomyopathy. EMRI is the only diagnostic tool for myocarditis. 
Dr. Memba will be teaching about this as he goes on. And are you able to go? Which of the following best describes the diagnostic modalities for COVID-19 related cardiovascular disease? Uh, the highly sensitive chop T is sufficient to secure the diagnosis of an acute myocardial infection in COVID-19 patients. B, the diagnosis of acute myocardial infection should also be, be should only be based on symptoms and signs. C, echo is important to diagnose stress-related cardiomyopathy. D, MRI is the only diagnostic tool for myocarditis. Please feel free to call. Dr. Member has not taught this yet. So take a guess if you want, or if you know, please answer. Then when he teaches, it will become easier. We have um, uh, less people voting. So is it enough for us to do a highly sensitive job? The diagnosis of an acute myocardial infarction be based on any signs and symptoms. E echo is important to diagnose stress-related cardiomyopathy. MRI is the diagnostic tool for myocarditis. When you say stress-related cardiomyopathy, this is the broken heart syndrome. I'm sure you will go into that. A broken heart is a very real phenomenon, isn't it? It's been proven scientifically that you can die from a broken heart. Dr. Member will tell us more about that. We're going to end the polling. So the sixth is poor question. This is the last one. The following are the clinical manifestations of cardiovascular disease in COVID-19 patients. Which of the following is not true? Which is false? A, cardiomyopathy is not a clinical manifestation in COVID-19 patients. COVID-19 patients can present with type 1 and type 2 myocardial infarction. C, life-threatening arrhythmias can occur in COVID-19. D, non-obstructive ischemia is a presentation in COVID-19. A, please feel, feel free to call. Dr. Member has not touched this yet, but we'll be touching everything soon. Okay, which of these are clinical manifestation of cardiovascular disease in patients with COVID-19? So in short, Dr. Member here, what you're asking is what are the um, cardiovascular consequences of COVID-19? How do you how do you go about yes? What okay. are the consequences? Cardiomyopathy is not a clinical manifestation in COVID-19 patients. Remember, we are looking for the false statement. So three of these are true except one. Which one is not true? B COVID-19 patients can present with type 1 and type 2 myocardial infarction. Life-threatening arrhythmia can occur in COVID-19. Non-obstructing ischemia is a presentation in COVID-19. Dr. Mwemba, these are some very hard questions. I'm glad I'm not home, so I don't have to vote. <laughs> I think they're very important questions. Of course. Because, because I think that we need to think about whenever we have these patients coming. Oh. If when you don't know, sometimes you just dismiss them. This is exactly. When you know, it means that you need to, then you start thinking about what the mind does not know, the eye cannot see. So we're going to end that. And this is how we voted. Most people actually feel that A is not true. So meaning they think cardiomyopathy is a clinical manifestation. Then we have various answers. I'm sure Dr. Mwemba will go into that. So we'll go through the clinical cardiovascular manifestations of COVID-19. Um, 
And these include elevation cardiac biomarkers. And I think that we've, just, we've already started discussing uh, troponin issues. Now, why do we do troponin? Because in, um, in ischemic pathology, it will be high. Even in non ischemic pathology, it will be high. So, meaning that these patients will have um, um, a coronary heart disease because of ischemia and coronary heart disease uh, uh, non ischemic. They will also have cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, they will have a thromboembolic uh, phenomenon. They can go into cardiac shock and cardiac, um, cardiac arrest. So, let's discuss about elevation of cardiac markers. So, they are an indicator of myocardial injury. And we define myocardial injury as elevated high sensitive cardiac troponin greater than. 99% um, of the upper limit of normal. Um, or if you can't do this, uh, if there's any evidence of a new ECG chain or any new ECG or an echo abnormality. So already here you can see that uh, troponin alone uh, might not be enough. So you'll have to either use troponin to uh, define this or you can use ECG or, or an echo. Um, mentioned that troponin correlates with the COVID disease severity and mortality. Um, so individuals like I showed previously, individuals that have high uh, troponin, they are more likely to have severe disease, they are more likely to die. Um, um, and, and this study here looked at uh, non-survivors. So those who died had higher levels of troponin 1 elevation than those uh, uh, who did not die. And before they died, the troponin continues to continues to continue to rise until the time of uh, time of death. So when you do a troponin, it's not just a matter of saying doing a troponin is high. We need to monitor because those who have uh, who continue having a, a rising troponin are more likely to die. Um, uh, when you compare to non those who survived, the troponin levels do not change much. Um, and so this evidence tells us that uh, when you do a troponin, probably it's important that you repeat that troponin uh, within a few days so that you just monitor whether it's going up. It means that if it keeps going up, it means mortality. I will see the, the disease will get sick. This slide um, uh, just tells you that differentiating potential etiologies um, can, be, can be a challenge. Now, I just wanted to look illustrate on the cartoon here is that when you have um, a plug that dislodges and then there's a clot inside and then it blocks. So plug dislocate, uh, dislodging or ruptures and then forms a clot and we call that as type 1 myocardial infarction. Um, when you have uh, just a vessel going into spasms and it narrows the uh, the blood supply to the heart, then that becomes type 2 myocardial. When you have a, a plaque or atherosclerosis that bends the static and doesn't move, it doesn't been dislodged, again, I, that is also a type 2, type two uh, myocardial. Um, when you have, for example, an individual who has um, um, sepsis uh, flow to the myocardium is impaired, and so there's a supply demand. Uh, imbalance again, that one is called infarction. So you can see that these three are type 2 myocardial infarction. The one where there's uh, uh, rupturing and thrombosis, and that becomes a type 1. Um, type one. And all of these can occur in COVID patients. Type 1 can occur, type 2 can occur, myocardial injury due to DIC can also occur, and then ischemic injury can, can occur. So let me go a bit into type one. Um, type one can be because of cytokine uh, storm. Now, how does inflammation affect this? The plaque becomes unstable, so it can easily rupture. And then after rupturing, it forms a thrombus, forming type one. Um, and this is evidenced uh, in SARS, actually. Uh, that's when one patient, in SARS patients, acute uh, MI was the cause of death in two of the five fatalities. So we know from SARS. Um, and there's been significant association even with uh, influenza. So influenza, we also know, 
that there's an association between type 1 and women. How about in COVID-19? In COVID-19, we have anecdotal reports. So this seems to point to the fact that this can also happen in, uh, in COVID-19. COVID so viral infection can increase often uh, supply to the myocardium via hypoxia and, and vasoconstriction. How about type 2? Uh, type 2 myocardial infarction can also probably happen in um, these patients. Patients with underlying coronary heart disease uh, can go into septic shock. And septic shock, like I said earlier on, you have reduced blood supply and uh, demand mismatch. And so the myocardium is not supplied with uh, enough oxygen, and that can cause myocardial High sensitivity toponym is not sufficient to cure the diagnosis of acute coronary. You cannot make a diagnosis of acute coronary when only high uh, sensitive toponym has, 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 has gone up. So you need other co uh, other um, investigative um, um, uh, other imaging need for you to make a diagnosis of fight your uh, your troponin up being up. So diagnosis of acute MI should also be based on symptom and sign. Hypertension, chest pains, uh, breathlessness, and then you do an ECG and then the ECG gives you those changes uh, of the patient as you are evaluating the patient. How about myocardial Injury with DIC. Um, so DIC is present in, was present in 15 of 21 patients, uh, and that was 71% of COVID non survivors. So those who did not survive when they did analysis, they found that uh, they had very high DIC as compared to those who did that. Only zero point. It tells you that uh, DIC might be implicated in causing uh, myocardial, myocardial infarction. How does this happen? It could be because of thrombosis to the coronary arteries. It could be because of the reduced perfusion because of those micro thrombus. It could be bleeding, um, um, and that bleeding can lead to uh, a injury. So, the IC has been implicated in thrombosis, it has been implicated in focal necrosis of the myocardium and severe cardiac, um, cardiac uh, dysfunction. And this DIC myocardial injury has been reported in two COVID patients. So this is confirmed that this might occur in this patient. Then we come to non-ischemic myocardial injury. Uh, this is where we're going to discuss the cardiomyopathy uh, injury. So myocarditis can either be acute or fulminant myocarditis. Um, and you can have what we call the, the stress induced um, uh, cardiomyopathy. Difficult for you to make a difference between acute and fulminant. Um, and we know two patients have been reported with what we call the reverse um, uh, Takosubo stress cardiomyopathy. And I'm going to show you uh, pictures of what this is and probably explain it a bit in the next. Um, um, and we know acute heart failure has occurred in the 3% uh, in those who are critical E without even having a history of previous uh, heart disease uh, in Washington, for example. So this tells you that just COVID might cause acute heart failure in the individuals. Um, importantly, and I think that for all, some of us who play soccer or those who do running and everything, so, um, cardiomyopathy can develop in COVID-19 patients without or no symptoms at all. And this is very important that even in influenza, when someone has influenza, we tell them not to exercise until the flu is, is gone. So this is a uh, <coughs> mechanism. Now, this slide is just trying to show you what is the reverse, um, the reverse uh, Takosubo. So this is a physiological um, uh, consequence that when you, have, you are stressed and you have stress, it seems that um, when the heart is contracting, instead of it contracting very well to empty everything, in this particular type, a, a typical uh, takosubo is that the apex remains uh, non-contractile, whereas the base contracts, and therefore 
gives you this shape that we're seeing here, uh, <clears throat> that the apex is more dilated than the mid. And this could just be for stress. Or a person going for surgery, and they're stressed because they're going for surgery, and suddenly their BP is uh, getting down, and they have uh, palpitations and things like that, and you do an echo. So, Dr. Mwemba, just before you go on, so you have a weakening of the left ventricle cell part. Yes. So at the base and the top, they remain the same. And then they form this distinct uh, vessel like yes. shape. It's a and Japanese you can see, water and you can carry. See, and you can see it actually here that when you look at in uh, with an echo, you see that this is your apex. And your apex here is quite dilated. Whereas the base here is narrow because here it can contract very well as opposed to the I found it interesting that in COVID-19, they are seeing the reverse Takotsubo phenomena because Takotsubo typically will be seen in highly stressful situations and it's been reported in people who've experienced earthquakes, exactly. people who experienced the loss of a loved one. True. So I, I believe that... Or just preparing for surgery, for example, and the stress because you don't know what's going to happen uh, in, during the surgery and then this just happens. But in these patients, what happens? It's the opposite. So instead of you, you can see that here, the apex uh, is okay, but you can see the arrows here that uh, during COVID is that there's contracting and it's the apex that contracts more than uh, the, the middle part. And you can see that this is what you see in a reverse uh, toxicity all time. And the two patients, this has been um, in COVID. And the fulminant myocarditis, so these here, are histopathological yeah. so samples. Are, yeah. So these are histological samples, and what I'm just trying to say here, but obviously this is easier to make uh, than a biopsy. Uh, myocardium, which we can't, probably most times we can't do, and we might just uh, uh, elicit a uh, But you can see the amount of cells infiltrating in fulminant, but the fulminant one has a lot of cells infiltrating the myocardium, as opposed to, uh, to, the, to the acute one. Now to make a difference between the two, is very high. Whether this is linked to it so high uh, troponin is something that we Well, I described this previously that uh, myocardial injury can uh, occur because of the cytokine storm. Um, and we know uh, SARS CoV 2 can elicit the increased release of these uh, cytokines. Um, and these cytokines are the ones that we think that can depress your. Uh, Arrhythmias, they are high in, uh, in, a, in a study of 137 patients in Wuhan. Uh, they found that actually up to 7% individuals, uh, when they presented, they had palpitations as one of the first thing presenting symptoms. When a patient comes with palpitation, it might be just probably they have, uh, have an arrhythmia. More common, obviously, in those who are sick, for example, in ICU. It was put 4% as opposed to those patients who are not in ICU. So when these patients were admitted to ICU, it's important that we probably also start looking uh, for them and do um, ECG. Um, again, uh, troponin might be an indicator. So for individuals that have high troponin, uh, it was found that the incidence of malignant uh, arrhythmia was, uh, was higher. So if you do a troponin, and uh, you find such a patient, it would be important that probably you do, uh, you do an ECG because you might have a very bad uh, rhythm. And so you can see that some of them have an unstable ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And I'm just showing here how ventricular tachycardia uh, uh, can appear uh, in a patient with COVID and ventricular fibrillation. So it's just important that uh, uh, these patients are first to when you come to it. Um, here, I'm just trying to show that um, a thrombosis can, can happen. And you can see this lady here, the solid limb, uh, other one, no more. Um, this could be because of prolonged immobilization, uh, the propensity because of uh, COVID to DIC, uh, the propensity for hypercoagulable states, and like, active uh, inflammation because of the, of the cyt cytokine. <clears throat> so you see that. In ICU, again, uh, those who are DVT was 27% as compared to not in uh, The critically ill, again, are the ones who are likely to have. Important to mention that that's the reason we always ask for these D-lines. The reason we ask for fibrin. The reason we ask for FDPs and fibrin. Um, and these usually will be higher 
then it will help individuals who have no, who have no hope. This slide is just trying to show you how a non-ischemic myocardial uh, can, can happen in COVID. Um, and you can see that this, this was uh, a number of patients, and that's just showing you the age range, and the most of them are very old. Um, and most of them had, you can see the number of comorbidities that they, they had. Uh, because being old, the susceptibility increased uh, comorbidities. And the next one just shows you the number, uh, the, the symptoms that they had. So it ranges from dry cough to palpitations to hypotension to reduced uh, oxygenation. So they can present in different um, different ways. So the symptomology can be different from this patient. Um, and these are the investigations that are done. So you can see the varied of investigation that these patients need to be working. With. It's not only one test going to give you the, the diagnosis. You need to do a good worker for you to come up with the diagnosis. And the majority of them had myocarditis. Um, and that was the treatment. And since at least uh, five, is it five out of them recovered? One was, by the time this was presented, it was still on. Does that mean experience? This is where we are today. Uh, today we had zero, so we remain at 265 uh, with seven, seven days. Uh, and this is how has the numbers have been spread up over until I think. Um, we only looked at, um, I'm sorry, we only looked at 41 discharge patients for us. Um, I couldn't access the uh, inpatients. I don't know why so I'm only telling you, telling you of the 41 patients. You see the majority are men, uh, almost over 75% of them are men. And you can see the, the average age is around 40, 40 years. You mentioned that 23% of them are over 50 years, and 10% uh, uh, hypertensive and 10% diabetic. Uh, it seems uh, hospital stay is longer because of diabetes to uh, have uh, DM uh, hypertension. These are our mortalities, and you can see that we have stroke, we have hypertension, uh, we have hypertension, we have AKI, HIV, uh, we have um, hypertension, stroke, and we have HIV. And all these are highlighted here is that uh, they could be COVID related. Uh, from what I've heard, they could be COVID related because of either uh, cytokines going up and killing your kidneys and whatever. So all I'm saying is that it is important that we look for these comorbidities as these patients are dying. You can see that um, one, two, three of the seven have hypertension and two of them had strokes. And the eight, eight year old had, uh, this is TMA, which is from um, thrombotic microangiopathy, which is the hypercoagulable state and the other from uh, cytopenia, which can easily lead you into bleed. And they had also AKI here, or HIV. I do not know, uh, maybe actually those who are HIV and they're not well treated is that probably the inflammation due to HIV but also have an impact on vascular um, outcomes. Now, how about therapy? Um, obviously, most of these patients, the, the way we do it is that you wait until they have symptoms. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Fellowship, because you gave me this slide. Uh, I like the slide, and even when it was sent very at the last minute, I said I should, I'll put it there. Now, you can see that when you have um, an infection, is that what happens first of all is that the viremia goes very high. And um, once it goes very high, obviously your body has to respond. Um, when your body responds later on, is that you have. Um, cytokines being produced to, for you to defend yourself and probably clear the infection. Um, <clears throat> but what we do is that most times that we start intervening and someone has already had the symptom, that might be, might probably, we need to rethink our treatment. Um, that maybe do we delay in giving medication? Uh, do our antiviral drugs uh, work because, don't work because we give them late? Um, 
you can see the, how the oxygen saturation uh, drops when your cytokines go, go up. Um, and then by the time we are intervening, it means that the saturations are, are really very, uh, very low. Maybe we need to intervene just before this, whatever, before anything goes, uh, goes, goes wrong. Um, and mentioning this is that obviously now, even now, that I think people, for example, to give ECMO, to give um, a plasma exchange, uh, to give uh, hemoperfusion, that people are trying to say that, look, before someone probably saturates, the moment you see that the BP point is very low, probably that's the time that you need to start giving. This is something that we all need to start um, in about. Uh, how about in this patient? Obviously, the treatment is um, patient-specific. Patient um, if you have uh, an MI, you intervene by primary PCI or thrombolytics. Um, if you have a myocardial injury, obviously it carries the, the worst prognosis. And so monitoring is very important and probably keeping your hemodynamics okay. If you have a coagulable state, you might need to give uh, thromboprophylaxis and probably we did done this in some of some of our patients. And then AC inhibitors, like I showed on that, is like it's very controversial at the moment, but the guideline is that uh, you might need to continue until, unless you think that the patient is being treated. And then you do the normal um, antiretroviral that we do give. Uh, but remember that if you're going to combine a lot of drugs, make sure that you monitor the QT. Um, uh, for individuals that have mechanical uh, Secretin support, uh, you can give ECMO and mm -hmm. you can give uh, intraiotic balloon, uh, ballooning. But this, we can't even do it. But I think that there's a lot that we can do apart from giving the The summary pre existing CVD or uh, cardiovascular disease patients seem more prone to severe complications of COVID. Increase mortality. So I think we've answered that patients who are in ICU are more likely to die. This might be directly because of the cardiovascular disease, and it might be age. Right? Our clinical manifestations. Uh, I've explained this that we, we can have a myocardial infarction, uh, and all the ranges of myocardial infarction can happen. Type one, type two. Um, you can also have myocardial because of DIC and cytokines. Um, you can also have myocarditis and stress-induced adrenaline, which I've showed you. You can have arrhythmias, you can have thromboembolism, um, and mechanisms of injury are multifactorial. You can see the number of things. The treatment is directed at specific cardiac pathology. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe all of us actually, from now on, we should never shake hands. And maybe all of us now, from now on, we need to wear uh, designer-made masks. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Mwemba. I'm almost saying from now on, never talk, because that is also what's contributing to the spread. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'll allow some comments, any questions from our, our network before Dr. Mwemba goes into discussing the case. I know we've gotten a lot of questions about what's happening in Levy. I hope this satisfies people's curiosity and how complex the patients can be. But I'll tell you one thing I've taken home. As the Ministry of Health has decided to do active surveillance. So this means that all patients we are admitting to our adult medical ward and pediatric wards need to be tested for COVID. So we've made swabs available for this purpose. I'm sure this presentation has highlighted some people don't even have symptoms and they may have COVID. That's why we're tracing everyone. If you're in OBS and gynae, if you have the stigmata of COVID-19, we are going to test you. If you're in surgery, stigmata of COVID-19, we're going to test you. So all patients in medicines will get, will get a test. Um, I think we'll take some comments on this, Dr. Dr. Mwemba. Do we have any questions? I know we have a lot in the chat box, but we want to hear people speak. We are sitting on seven screens, Dr. Mwemba. You are there. Oh, someone is eating. You can black out some screens, chat <laughs> on that. <laughs> um, please switch on your, your videos because um, 
This is supposed to be interactive. Dr. Kongolo, please unmute yourself and go ahead with your comment. Dr. Kongolo. We've unmuted you, please go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, good, good afternoon, Dr. Foloshi. And Dr. good afternoon, Dr. Dr. Mwemba. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, very informative and we've learned a lot of things. Uh, I still have one concern, uh, that's about uh, ARBs and uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned how the virus enters the body through uh, the ACE2, and uh, that's one of the reasons why hypertensive people are prone uh, to, 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 to die seven times more than uh, non-hypertensive. Uh, that, that, that's really worrying. But uh, in the conclusion on the treatment, you mentioned that uh, for patients, hypertensive, taking SE inhibit SE inhibitors and the Arabid should continue unless if there is any suspicion whether the patient is deteriorating or, or, or something like that. So my question is for our routine patients whom we think that uh, they are prone due to their age and comorbidities, what should we advise them? Because some patients are educated, they are reading here and there. Now, when they are already on ACE inhibitors, what should we tell the patient? What's our position as a country for patients who are on ACE inhibitors or on ARBs? Thanks. Thank you so much for that question. Um, <clears throat> So I think that uh, across the whole world, uh, every day there's a review of whether ACE inhibitors or ARBs should come to who get uh, COVID-19. COVID um, there's, no, there's no study at the moment that has proven that uh, these patients actually get worse disease than not taking um, And therefore, unless you have an alternative that is not going to impact on the patient's outcome, uh, then ARBs and ACE inhibitors should be left uh, as part of the treatment. And I think that uh, if someone is very sick, I think that that's a discussion that all of us can have so that we see whether we can review the treatment for that particular person, or it will go individual patient. We think that uh, stopping the ARBs will help the patient, for example, the patients obviously have hypertension, I would not maintain the AFC. I would remove it because obviously they have other consequences apart from just listening. Yeah, so you're talking about ARBs, yeah. B for butter, not ARVs, please, when it says stop it. Uh, Mazabuka General, please go ahead. <laughs> Yes, good afternoon, Dr. Yeah. Member, Dr. Foloshi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, Dr. Foloshi, uh, your last statement you made about the routine testing of uh, all inpatients. When is that going to be extended to some of us in the far flung areas? Because the number of uh, test kits, the swabs, we get per location a week as a province. That's not just enough to cover just us as a hospital. So when are we going to be giving that support so that we can also do the mass testing like the Thank you. That's a good question. I think I'll let Davis answer it because all swabs should be accessed to MSL. You just have to order. It does not matter whether you are in Lusaka or Fafland. It's equal access to the swabs. Like for UTH, we actually go ourselves to pick up from MSL. Uh, Davis? So actually, you would also need to involve the province uh, yeah. uh, who needs to urgently order via medical stores as uh, Sombo has advised. So that's the directive right now. Just get in touch with the province where you are and then the province will order from the MSL. Thank you. Um, sorry, uh, so can I continue? So yeah. that 
is to be has a challenge because if we order as a hospital, we are told to get our commodities through the province. But the commodities which come through the province fall, are far less than what you actually need as a facility because the province has to share amongst all the testing areas within the province. So why can general hospitals also be allowed to make orders directly for medical stores, just like you do as UTH? Maybe that's something you should Right. All right. That is well noted. And um, please, you can get uh, my number or Sombo's number. We can chat further on this one. But for now, I think uh, we have noted the point that you have raised. Thank you so much. All right, thank thank you. you so much. We need to test more people. Please get in touch with us if you have issues of swabs. We will make sure that you have access. We really need to know where the pandemic is. Yeah. And we'll only ever know when we test people. As you can see, some people are actually asymptomatic. Dr. Dr. Laston, do you want to go ahead? Dr. Luchembe, please prepare to share the case. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. Um, <laughs> Uh, two or three cases among the mortalities that also had HIV. Can you comment on the status of antiretroviral therapy? And also, did you have the latest viral loads on those clients? Thank you. Okay. So the question is what? ARVs they were on and what the latest viral loads were. I will comment on the one that was presented last week. That one was on TLD and he was biologically suppressed. The one from Dola. So we have one from Dola who was just newly diagnosed, not on ARVs and was just being commenced at the time. He came with diarrhea disease and that's why you can see that he had a KRV. So the, uh, the antitrovirus just started one day and it deteriorated. So, uh, so he had previously no, um, his whatever. So probably, maybe the COVID tipped him into uh, into what was, we don't know. We, we can just know. speculate whether it was TB, uh, because at one time he desaturated um, and he was given some um, some oxygen. Uh, we don't know whether the saturation was because he had uh, hypertension or he had sepsis or this was all because of TB. It was not investigated fully for us to understand exactly what was happening. Uh, Dr. Bill, please go ahead with your question. Then the other patient, um, there was a patient, the Kekaposi one, uh, he had very disseminated uh, Kekaposi sarcoma. Again, he had, uh, I think, including chest, um, and then tested positive. And we also think that he died of KS. Like <laughs> Dr. Bill, please go ahead. Dr. Mosisia, please get ready to share your screen. Thank you. Um, I would like to understand. Um, for non-hypertensive patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19, will it be wise to put them on preventive treatment like on anti-aggregate and uh, antithrombotic treatment? So, so the slide I presented here is a slide that is in the thinking uh, that maybe as, as the scientific communities that we need to re start thinking about what our innovations are at the moment. Because at the moment, if you are um, asymptomatic, we don't actually give you nothing uh, because we think that um, you are fine. And it's true that the majority of people who are asymptomatic, they remain asymptomatic, and we have seen this even in our, in our yeah. settings. So the decision is that, do we need to monitor viral loads so that probably we say that the viral set point that you need to start? That question we have not yet answered. And so I cannot tell you that we need to them for there are studies that are going on to see whether we can answer that question and uh, when those studies are out probably we'll be able to answer the question and we can change our, our policy. The slide I was showing here was just to prompt us to start thinking that maybe we need to start rethinking of the way we are doing the intervention, especially for those of us. Maybe there are certain symptoms that we see and we need to intervene when these individuals start having those symptoms. That's what I was trying to do. Okay, I'm sure we'll get more information as we present the case. Dr. Msisia, please go ahead and share your screen. Dr. Luchembe has presented the case before and he was stationed at the COVID-19 center and he was seeing patients. We'll share the screen from here. Luchembe, are you with us? 
And there's a question, uh, Dr. Smita, please unmute yourself. I sense that you may want to put context to your question. Your question is, is Zambia seeing, uh, identifying more TB cases because of COVID? You want to explain, to give context to your question? Sure, I think, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Smita Ghosh. I'm an epidemiologist uh, at the CDC, monitoring, evaluation, and the data analysis branch uh, with the Division of Global HIV TB. And I was wondering, um, you know, just like, uh, Doctor, you mentioned about the third case um, where there might have been disseminated disease or there might have been other symptoms or signs related to TB. I'm wondering if since, since the, there are a lot of similarities um, and you might have covered this before with TB um, and COVID, um, especially with the respiratory you know, symptoms, I'm wondering uh, because of COVID testing and increased you know, attention to COVID um, signs and symptoms, are you all identifying additional TB cases than you usually do in Zambia? Okay. Um, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we do not have any data to back this, but typically I think we are collecting just a nasopharyngeal swab. There's been a proposal that all uh, people that test negative for TB, the sputum can then be processed for um, a COVID-19 uh, testing. However, we do not have data to actually answer your question. But we'll reach out to the TB program and when we get something, we'll, we'll let you know. I've seen that Mary, who provided that slide that you, <laughs> I got credit for, has joined us. So we'll be talking to more with Mary and we'll, we'll share that data. Dr. Luchembe, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, please go ahead. You have a short time to present your case. First. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, Dr. Luchembe has stated, Registrar in general medicine, and I was stationed at Levy, and I was seeing the COVID patients. So today I'll present a male 74 who came in with a two-day history of fever and flu-like symptoms. Uh, do note is that he, he was a, he was a contact of a positive case and had been on home isolation. Uh, upon arrival, he had no complaints of cough, diarrhea, headache. Uh, he only agreed or described body aches and some chills. He had been, uh, he'd gotten a, a recent swab two days before presentation and the result had just come out on that day and he had been a confirmed positive for COVID-19. Uh, his past medical history is that he's a non-diabetic. Uh, he'd been on metformin and glimepiride. Uh, he's HIV uh, uh, negative and his, the rest of his medical history was unremarkable. Uh, he's a married man and socially denied smoking and taking alcohol, uh, but agrees to dealing in petroleum. So we thought about uh, that exposure. His examination, he was fully conscious and oriented with a respiratory rate at 18 breaths per minute, uh, saturating at over 94% on room air. His BP was 154 over 75 millimeters of mercury, which is slightly elevated systolic pressure and a pulse of 74. Uh, he had a temperature of 36.2 degrees Celsius, and the rest of his examination was unremarkable. So aside from his COVID-19 tests, we considered that his, his symptomatology could just be a common flu or uh, malaria and bacterial co-infection. So his baseline uh, lab results from the, on admission was that he had a normal full blood count, normal liver and kidney functions, and his RVT was done negative. His malaria RVT was negative as well. Um, you can go to the next slide. So uh, for, uh, about day six post admission, the patient deteriorated, uh, presenting with difficulty breathing and the worsening fever and chills. On that particular day, he's, uh, we added um, we put him on low volume O2 with various prongs accretors per minute and started him on azithro and hydroxychloroquine. His BPs had been sustainably elevated, starting straight from the one on admission, and so we started him on amlodipine. His saturations at this point after starting him on, on low volume O2 was above 95%. Uh, so clinically, we maintained him on those medicines and we ordered a few tests. We can go back to the table for the next. 
which was about the third, which was six days after, his full blood count was still normal. His, both his liver and kidney function were, were okay. We ran an ECG before commencing his azithro and um, hydroxychloroquine, and uh, there were no contraindications. His QT was okay, and we asked for serial ECGs. After about five, four days, uh, his, he deteriorated further. We only learned at that particular time he had been taking his second and uh, his second anti-diabetic drugs. So he was polyuric and polydipsic, and he couldn't leave his bed because he was getting tired easily, and he had increased need for oxygen, and he was temperatures were also increased, uh, raised a bit more. So we had concern for pulmonary embolism, uh, acute coronary syndrome, likely MI. And we also thought he may have had a superimposed bacterial uh, pneumonia. Uh, his tests at that particular point, he had a normal liver function tests, uh, normal kidney functions. His INR and PT, his INR was normal. His PT was mildly elevated or prolonged and CRP was elevated. Uh, cardiac enzymes were normal with uh, elevated D-dimers of 1,153. At this particular point, again, show us the next slide. We commenced him, because he had finished his trial of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. We commenced him on low molecular weight heparin, uh, cochicin. We introduced his second oral hypoglycemic, and we increased his oxygen to about eight liters uh, per minute. And we started as, uh, placing him on awake proning uh, throughout the day to improve his, uh, his breathing. Uh, after this, we repeated his renal functions and liver functions, and they were uh, consequently normal. His uh, symptoms of polyuria and polydipsia resolved. Uh, by the time, six days after introducing the low molecular weight heparin and the cochicine, the patient was successfully weaned off of O2. Uh, we continued both drugs for 10 days, and we discontinued them on day 20. Uh, we repeated his PCR tests for COVID and uh, he had two negatives by the time he was discharged. He was successfully discharged on day 34. Uh, he, was, he had uh, very mild complaints on, on discharge. These are just his x-rays as he was admitted in, in, at the facility, uh, starting from his day of admission on the 28th, uh, all the way up to uh, the time after he com almost completed his cochicine and low molecular weight heparin. Uh, so our questions after seeing this patient were, could the patient's comorbid conditions have contributed to progression from mild to severe disease? And our second question is, which of the treatments that the patient received could have led to his improvement? Thank you so much, Dr. Luchembe. In summary, Dr. Luchembe has presented a 74-year-old male who was being treated at the isolation center for COVID-19, he presented with uh, two like symptoms. So he was feverish, had a bit of body aches and uh, chills. Of note, his comorbidity profile included hypertension and diabetes. So during the course of his illness, he received azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. Unfortunately, he actually started decompensating around day seven. He started desaturating. What was added was uh, awake proning uh, without intubation, low molecular weight, heparin and cochicin. They also adjusted the, the dose of glimepramide, that was the anti-diabetic medication. Uh, they managed to actually win him off O2 by day 16 and was discharged on day 34. So this is a patient who came in, he was mild and progressed to being severe. Their question is that, what made this patient progress from mild to severe? Is it because he had comorbid conditions? He also showed us some x-rays, which you see some profound changes and uh, infiltrations by the time he was there for uh, 16 days. They also want to know, they did a lot of things. They gave azithro, they gave hydroxychloroquine, they gave cortisone, they awake prone him. They gave low molecular weight heparin, which is Clexel. 
what works. So maybe we take some questions from the network before Dr. Mwemba. I know a lot of people zeroed in from the ID team and physicians and um, they, they contributed to whatever treatment you see here. In the US. Even in the US and in the UK. So aside Dr. Luchembe's good work, they want to know why he progressed and what worked. How did this 74-year-old, which we saw his age is, a, is quite a big risk factor for patients. Dr. Kongolo, <clears throat> please go ahead with your question. Yeah, good, good afternoon again. Good uh, afternoon. Yes. Um, I think uh, maybe in Dr. Mwemba's presentation, he did not emphasize on how to manage diabetes into uh, COVID. Uh, I feel that uh, once a diabetic patient is admitted for whatever condition, that is stressful moment, and uh, this patient, if he was on uh, some oral hypoglycemians, should be switched to insulin. And uh, in this case, the patient continued on uh, oral uh, hypoglycemia and later on developed uh, some polyuria and polydipsia, which worsened, to my view, which worsened uh, his condition and prolonged his stay in the hospital. Um, I don't know what the protocol is. In my opinion, such patient could have been given insulin from the very beginning. And uh, what helped more the patient to recover, I, I think it's neither the, the chloroquine, the colchicine, and so on. It could be the clexin which was added. And at the same time, the diabetes improved, though they did not give us how the sugar behaving during the admission. So that was my question and my contribution. Thanks. Oh, that's, that's, I think that's an excellent contribution, Dr. Kongolo. I'll let Dr. Mustice speak about the insulin because this is something we talked about because yeah. everyone that's admitted, obviously, has to be on insulin. I know he had missed some doses before he came in, but Dr. Mustice, yeah? Okay, so initially his, his fasting blood sugar profile was normal. Uh, the, then we noticed that he had run out of his glimepiroid apparently when he was in, in the hospital. So I think it was about day five when he had a, an elevated FBS. So when the moment we reintroduced, the moment we reintroduced uh, his other hypoglycemics, it improved his, uh, his fasting. And we'd held, we'd held off his, his insulin for that reason, because we thought it was just poor control when, from non-compliance rather than the anxious stress, yes. And I'm sure people were thinking about the, the, the risk benefits. Um, ideally, we do switch people that are admitted. I know he came in ambulance, then became sick. But you know, insulin, the number of doses you have to give when you are yes, trying to like, take it off is a lot more, which would have made a lot of exposure from the healthcare workers. I believe that was the reasoning. But of course, Dr. Kongolo, you are correct. But here is a man who's put his money on the heparin. Heels is the heparin that works. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in a wet crony. <laughs> so I want to hear more opinion out there before Dr. Member zeroes in on these two questions. Uh, do we have any comments, any questions? Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Um my question is, uh, the presenter didn't um, tell us what was the blood sugar levels, because he talked of day four, that's when they started um, uh, on uh, checking up on the, uh, the sugars. So I think after they managed the sugars, together with the azithromycin, that's what made the patient to progress very well. Thank you so much, Elisha. So Elisha feels that it was the glycemic control which meant the problem, and the azithromycin. So somebody believes in azithromycin. Do we have any other takes? 
some people feel it was the heparin, um, some people feel it was the sugar control, some people feel it's the azithro. Peter, okay, Dr. Bill, I assume this is you and Tim, please go ahead. Peter, okay. I, I just wanted to find out, my name is Chinyama from Petauke. Yes, Chinyama, we can hear you very well. Okay, I wanted to find out about the negative test. Uh, we, we noticed that the, the real-time test at some point became negative, and I'm assuming it was a false negative, or how reliable is our, our current test that we are Thank you. That's a, a very good question. I believe uh, on the slide that it showed it was positive, became negative, and got another positive. I know that patients are not discharged until they have two consecutive tests that are 24 hours apart. I guess his question is why did he have a negative then a, a positive? In short, he's asking what is the sensitivity and specificity of the PCR test that we're using? Um, we'll let, um, please, who's, somebody else has raised their hand, I can't see. And we'll let Monze go ahead with the contribution. Uh, thank you so much, Doc. Uh, my question is uh, based on the coaching and uh, heparin. I want to understand why the two drugs were given in this case. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. Why heparin? Why cochicin? Uh, Dr. Kongolo, please go ahead. Yes, yes. just one more question. When the patient changed condition, uh, was DKA ruled out? Uh, because the patient developed difficulties in breathing and uh, started desaturating, as well as the, the polyuria, polydipsia. Uh, I think putting all these signs together, one of the biggest differential is also a DK. Was that ruled out? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kongolo. It's good to know that even in the context of COVID, people are able to like broaden the differential. Dr. Musisia. Yes, we did rule out DK. Okay. So he says, yes, they ruled it out. Um, Dr. Mwemba, I know we discussed uh, heparin and cortisine. What was the rationale? And do you want to take a, a take on these questions because we have we run out of time? Um, so, could the patient's comorbidity conditions have contributed to progression from mild to severe? So, maybe uh, answering first of all the question about insulin. You know, the way these patients are admitted is that they are admitted as symptomatic. So, I, I I do not think that uh, if you are limited asymptomatic or with mild symptoms, you can take your drugs orally and everything. I think that that's a point that you need to change your insulin. Insulin, I think, no, we just admit it because we want to monitor it. And if the condition changes in between, then you can easily switch to it. So I think that the switching to insulin, what happened at the right time when the patient was getting, uh, getting, uh, getting uh, worse. Um, comorbidities. I think that from the presentation that we've done, uh, these patients are likely to get worse fun. So, they, so the, the way this patient is presented fits actually in the cardiovascular uh, disease category that we, he's, he was 74, he has diabetes, he had diabetes, and he had uh, hypertension. And so all the three of them put him at a risk to develop um, a severe disease. So for me, it was not a surprise that actually this happened. And was this COVID that related? I think so. Um, just looking at the chest X-ray um, tells you that it was it was it was um, it was uh, agreeing with what we know about um, about about COVID. So I think that the comorbidities uh, contributed to his um, to his uh, condition worsening. Um, I do not know if you have mild um, DKA, which was ruled out here that actually your situation can easily deteriorate like that. The only thing that I think that can explain uh, the situation going, going low with that, whether he was dehydrated, is meets, uh, most likely, most likely COVID. And I'm still saying most likely COVID. 
because we are humans, we might have missed um, uh, miss some. Um, but just to of, say, I think on the courtesy, um, yes, the courtesy and the So, therapy. which of the treatments that patients received would have led to this improvement? Um, I think that when we give treatment, we do not say uh, this drug is going to do the one thing or the other drug is going to do. We manage patients as, 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 as one. Uh, and so whatever intervention that is going to help the patient, that intervention has to be taken. We didn't give the cause oxygen, maybe the patient would have died. Uh, if we didn't hydrate the patient, maybe the patient would have died. We didn't um, change to insulin, maybe the patient would have uh, uh, deteriorated. Uh, so we, need to, we needed to look at all possibilities. And I think that I mentioned that these patients have a propensity for hypercoagulant and strain. And uh, one of the things that you do is to ensure that you give them um, uh, prophylaxis for, um, uh, and that's why the, the heparin was, was, was given. So the heparin did is one, probably it prevented the hypercoagulant state. Patient that he was diabetic, he had COVID, he had hypertension, he was old, he's prone to all these hypercoagulant states. And so heparin was, was a good choice that we um, gave. Obviously we had a discussion whether we, we should give it, but at the end of the day, the, uh, at that time, we were not very clear whether we should have given, but we went ahead and did it. And, and the message that is coming now from my presentation, you can see that uh, probably most of these patients will be flexing on How about cosichin? Uh, I think in the slide there, I showed where, uh, and again, thank you to Mary, and thank you to, uh, to, to end that slide. But the slide shows that um, the cytokine profile lessens just when the viral Pyremia is coming, uh, is coming down. And also uh, hypoxemia also sets in when, when your, um, when your uh, viral load, uh, when your cyto uh, cytokines are going very, uh, very high. And it seems that probably that's the time that people start to deteriorate and show symptoms before your BP starts to, to crash. So there was a debate that uh, we need to deal with the cytokine um, problem. Uh, we needed to intervene so that the patient does not go into a uh, an overt storm where the BPs and his intubation would, would have failed to uh, to control that. Now we had several options. The options were either to give um, IVIG, which we didn't have in the country. Uh, the other option was to consider a plasma exchange to be able to remove those cytokines. At the moment, at that particular time, that was not an option. It was we only have one machine that can do that. And to move that machine all the way from the to take that time was not an option. We had an option of probably buying uh, cartridges so that we do what we call hemofiltration and use one of the balanced machines. It was not a, an option. And therefore, the only option was a look. We were not very sure. Uh, so, one of the options is to reduce inflammation, to reduce interleukin, is to give uh, cost. And we have read a number of articles where costing was given and the patient improved. And we said, look, costing was. Uh, was cheap, the dose was far much less than you would give in a patient who has arthritis, and therefore, uh, I believe we, we gave the patient, we're not going to lose anything, um, and that's the reason the procedure was given. And when you see uh, you know, the profile, is that it shows you that actually, when they repeat, later on, when they started repeating the inflammatory matters, inflammatory matters were, were, were also dropping. So, both heparin and probably oxygen. That have contributed. Now, I should mention that costing is not a, an approved drug for the industry, but uh, people are trying to use, so do not go there and start just giving costing. Uh, I think that is a, a decision that all of us need to discuss and see whether a patient is benefiting the patient it was not yet approved. Thank you. Oh, I think that's great, Dr. <clears throat> Member. Just to be clear that he did not receive insulin was kept on the same on the same treatment, as we said, there is, there's a benefit. And the other thing is that while all our patients are kept in Navy, they are actually not hospitalized. They are, it's more for isolation. So the moment you move to the same care is maybe when you would have benefited from insulin, but the number of doses you would have needed and the amount of PPE, because PPE you need to keep changing. And I think he was observed to actually be fine even on the oral. But that's a good recommendation, Dr. Pongolo. I think more importantly, from you received an array of things, the azithro, the chloroquine, the cortisine, 
cortisin is some sort of immune modulator. We looked in our setting, that's what we have. And then we also gave heparin because all these actually, there are studies that have been done. Some have been good, have had good outcomes, some are still vocal. So most of these drugs are still under study, but uh, patients won't wait for studies. So cortisin was based on a case report. The azithrochloroquine was based on the initial low shaking study. Heparin has been shown in retrospective studies that people who received heparin actually had less mortality. So we did just put this from the air. And we hope as we get more data, we'll be able to inform our network on what we can use. However, all patients must be treated under the guidance of infectious disease specialists and physicians. Uh, Dr. Musisia, do you have anything to say? Is uh, the explanation okay? Is it understood? Yes. The explanation is okay, especially that we had the, we had the discussion before. Some of the, the discussion answered a lot of the questions. Yes, I thought that was great, but you received uh, some kudos from Matero and I think from everyone. Job well done. This patient had lost a lot of uh, comorbidities, he was 74, and we are thinking we are in a low income setting. What are we going to do? But people put their head to, heads together and this man made it. Please scan this URL and you have access to all the slides you've had, we've presented today, but we'll allow Dr. Mwemba to be able to relaunch the polls, Chatonda, so that Dr. Mwemba can explain the answers just quickly before we wind up. People can scan the URL and everything will come to your phone. But you will pause for him, right? Eh? Just the answers. I'm going on. You can just read the question. And okay. Tell us so what is the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and cardiovascular disease in severe COVID-19 in hospital patients compared with the general uh, population. So the answer is C. The prevalence is high in severe COVID-19 patients uh, in hospital patients. And I see that 82% it, it, of you uh, got that one correct. So we'll go to the next poll. So the answer for the first question is that you have more hypertension, diabetes, and CVT in patients who experience a severe form of COVID. And the second poll question, Dr. Mwemba. The second question is, what is the mortality rate in severe COVID-19 patients with hypertension, diabetes, CVD, compared with severe COVID-19 patients without these comorbidities? So, Mortality is high in severe COVID patients with hypertension, diabetes, and CBD. B. 100%. What is 100%? Oh, well, that's because only 12 of them got it. <laughs> no, 14. No, it's so 14. Yeah, are so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go to the third poll question. Third question. Which of the following statements best describes mechanisms of cardiac? Injury in COVID 19 patients. I'm still waiting for people to vote a bit. Five have voted so far. Six, seven, eight, ten, <laughs> twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. They were so, 16, well. so, 16, 18 people have voted. And um, yes, the answer is. G, cardiac injury is multifactorial. Thank you. So there's direct cardiotoxicity, the cytokine storm, hypoxemia, various things. Yes. It's not just one, one thing bit. that leads people mm -hmm. to have cardiac injury. And oh. poll number four, which of the following statements is true about high sensitive troponin in COVID-19 patients? I'm waiting for people to vote a bit. We didn't do well here. I didn't do well here. 
there's a balance. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. People, what, 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 what? It's tilting towards 6% of you have voted for D, and D is the correct answer. Number five. Which of the following statements is true about high sensitive cardiac troponin in COVID-19 patients? 17 so far have already I'm waiting for people to vote. Or which of the following statements best describes diagnostic modalities for COVID-19 patients? I know this one is a bit hard, um, but it's tilting towards the answer that I'm looking for. So 50% of you distributed across whatever, but 50% of you are saying uh, C. So C is important. Echo is important to diagnose pressulated myopathy. Um, the reverse. The last one. The following are the clinical manifestations of COVID in of CVD in COVID-19 patients. Which of the following statement? I'm waiting for people to vote. Please, please, please. One minute. Which one is false? Which is one is not true? Yeah, we're almost hitting 100% on that question. And yes, the answer is A. Which one is not true? So cardiomyopathy is not a clinical manifestation. You say it is a clinical manifestation as, as, as we've uh, shown. Thank you so much, Dr. Mwemba, for that. It was very inspiring. But I think for us now, we know why we need to be testing everyone for COVID-19, especially in the adult medical and pediatrics. As you can see, they can present with arrhythmias and no respiratory symptoms, with heart attacks and no respiratory symptoms. So everybody that admitted to medicine and kids, you need to swab everyone, even if they do not have the signs, the respiratory symptoms. Labs can be accessed by, by the provincial health offices uh, from MSL. So everybody should be able to get a swab now. There's a lot of swabs in country. Uh, thank you so much. Next week, we are coming to the end of the COVID-19 pandemic series. Next week, we'll have Professor Lloyd talking about how do we continue providing HIV, TB services in our facilities in the context of the pandemic. We need to remember that we are dealing with another epidemic. We've made great strides. We don't want to lose them. So we'll see what we'll talk about next week. Thank you so much, Dr. Member. Thank you all for tuning in. And we'll see you next week, 14.30 on Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.